see Sucker Soup on a hot summer day. Coffee comes back in a nerve wracking way. The dishes and laundry take the garbage out. What a day! What a day! Welcome to Capital Region today. I'm so happy that you're joining us today and we have a great lineup as always. We just are, I'm so fortunate to have such great guests come to the show. We're going to be starting out, uh, our first guests will be from the Schenectady Civic Players and they're doing a production called, uh, well, well, we'll not find out, it's called Play It Again, Sam. Um, but they'll be playing it again a few times actually <laughs> for their run. Uh, and then we're talking to the new director of the <coughs> Joe Nicole Prince House, which is an amazing place that they, uh, they're really doing quite a bit, but they're having um, for our community. And also they're having a fundraiser. It's a, it's a run, so we'll be talking about that. And then we're going to be talking, oh, I got these weight in the wrong direction. I'm sorry. I switched those, didn't I? Our second one is going to be Reading is Fun, and we're going to be finding out about their Scrabble Rama coming up as well. I guess I got them in the wrong direction. I'm really sorry. Um, and then we'll be talking with musicians of Malwick, and they're doing a production, uh, of, uh, for, which is really interesting. I can't wait to talk to her about this because this is about music from musicians that, that perhaps died in the Holocaust. So this is going to be really interesting. And then we're talking with a woman who is a writer and she uh, talks about unmasking motivation. So we're going to be, t and she's an author as well. So this will be a great, um, great show to, to learn something. And I always learn something, I know that. We're going to start right out. And I'm sorry about mixing those two up, Raymond. I think I did that and I'm so sorry. Um, but anyway, we're starting out with the Schenectady Civic Players, guys. Hello. Play it against Sam, Woody Allen. Hi, tell me about <laughs> it. What's it all about? Uh, I'll let you start, Evan. Uh, play it against You're the director. He's a director. Play it against <laughs> Sam is a uh, play written by Woody Allen. It's about uh, the main character is named Alan Felix, who is played by Ryan here. Uh, he's newly divorced and going through a very neurotic depression. Um, and his friends, uh, Dick and Linda, Linda played of course by Alexandra here, is uh, they're trying to motivate him to go back and, and get on dates and uh, also motivating him to get on dates is the ghost of Humphrey Bogart. The ghost of, <laughs> <laughs> who's the ghost? Uh, so Alan is a movie critic and uh, he's obsessed with old classic movies. So he, he, he gets You dated. know, Woody Allen was too. Of course, and, and I, I am as well. Um, so uh, uh, he daydreams about uh, Humphrey Bogart giving him dating advice from like the 30s and 40s. You know, just grab her and kiss her, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> which doesn't really play at the time of the play. Um, so it's played against Sam, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. it's That's really from Casablanca, play. isn't it? Yes, yeah, there's a lot Sam, of Casablanca yeah. and Maltese Falcon yeah. references. Yeah, for, uh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. You must have had a lot of fun doing this. Oh, it's so much fun. And, yeah. and, and I've got a great cast and a great crew working Okay, so it. talk about the cast, and then we'll talk with uh, Brian and... Uh, yeah. uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about these two first. Uh, I've known Ryan, Ryan for years yeah, and years. Ryan. And, uh, I, I say Brian, I'm sorry. I knew it was Ryan. <laughs> I had a Brian on the last show. So. I've, known, I've known Ryan for a number of years. I was lucky enough to direct him when I directed uh, Frost Nixon uh, uh, four years ago. Um, he, he's great. He's pretty incredible, actually. He's Thank very you. funny. Ryan. No, you are. Yeah, he's, go he's ahead. A pleasure to direct but we won't let that go to your head no no <laughs> and then um alexandra someone who who i've only been introduced to recently but i saw her in the minutes at albany civic oh so um, you were at all saying that. And, and she's really really tremendous good so tell me what part you play okay let's start out with alexandra yeah. i've already talked to you. yeah we've talked already <laughs> okay go ahead um i play linda um which is the wife of alan's best friend dick um, so I come in with my husband, we're going to cheer up our friend who just got divorced, but as things go on, Linda might start to develop some feelings for Alan Ooh. through the process of helping him on his own dating adventure. It starts off very, um, very innocent, we're just going to help get him back out there. I'm going to suggest my friends for him to go on dates with, but things do get a little complicated as they, as they go along. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And 
How about you, Brian? So I play <clears throat> Alan Felix, who uh, this, this is actually the third time in a row that I've been on your show where I've played someone I who's know, getting yeah. a divorce. I know, I know. So I mean, you were so good in that one. one I have a type. the name of it, but, uh -oh. but yeah, you were so good. <laughs> um, and, you know, he's, it's, it's the part that Woody Allen wrote for himself, both the play and the movie. And he Was is, this a movie? It was it a was. movie, yes. Yeah. Oh, one of the few movies because I don't didn't know it was direct. a movie. Oh yeah, yeah, and it was same Broadway cast was yeah. in the yeah. film, um, and Alan is just neurotic. He's neurotic in every place. He is, he is, is. Oh, and my gosh. Um, and I love the way he talks off to the to the audience. You know, yes. does he do that? In the he does, and yeah. and that's not something that I typically to, do because right? I, I, I don't love the whole you know breaking the fourth wall. We're all yeah. in this. Um, so Evan said, just look right down and. Talk to them in, and there's several monologues where he's directing it to the people sitting there. Yeah, I know. And that's yeah. what that's what he's famous for. Yeah, it's almost it like stand-up comedy routine. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He does that. So yeah, uh, Woody Allen, of course, is a prolific writer, and yeah. and I mean, he's an amazing. He's such a talented man. Many of his movies are that he's written were amazing. Yeah. So, and but they're all different. He really, from Annie Hall and all mm -hmm. the others. I mean, in you know the last rows of you know all of those. And <laughs> this play was written pretty early in his career. Oh, this was an it's, earlier it's one. It's 1969 is when this play premiered. So okay. it's still got that early silly Woody Allen vibe to it. Yeah. Good. I can't wait to see it. L yeah. Later in his career, he started developing more. Uh, you know. Philosophical. Semi dramatic <laughs> philosophical <laughs> plays. But this one is just pure pure comedy. It's yeah. really funny. A lot of what very touching. A lot of what Evan says is what would Bugs Bunny do? <laughs> and then do that. So we've got, you know, we've got the You're swinging door laugh. and yeah. We're going to slam things. Oh, yeah. We are, you know, it, it's my philosophy that if you're going to do it, do it. Yeah. yeah. You know, go to 10, and then if you need to take it back, take it back. But just go for it. What would Bugs Bunny do? You know, and, and, and these these actors are... At least he didn't say the Roadrunner, but that's <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> that's who Allie's basing her character on. Yeah. 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 Yes, it is. <laughs> How big is your cast, Evan? Uh, it's an eight-person cast. Eight-person? Uh -huh. Oh, that's pretty good yeah. size. There's... there's um, Three uh, actresses who are playing uh, multiple roles as the different dates that Alan goes on. Oh, okay. The play. Um, and they're having a lot of fun attacking all these characters and really going for it. Who, who are the other cast members? Um, Emily Bryan plays uh, uh, Alan's uh, ex-wife. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, I always have to have an ex. I always got to have an ex. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Michael Schaefer plays the ghost of Humphrey Bogart. Oh, Mike is in it. Oh, Mike is doing that. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. And he's a lot of fun. Um, Amber Acosta, Mary Borden, and Ashley Shuligar are playing the female ensemble. And then um, an actor that's new to me, uh, Patrick Fiaschetti, is playing Dick, Alan's okay, good, best friend. Good. And he's really, really great. We, uh, we are so talented. Um, the last show I did uh, for Capital Region today, we had three theater groups on. And I can't believe the talent that is yeah. out there for, you know, to... to, to I mean, I, I just spoke with one gentleman, and he said, I'm new to the area, and I had no idea. Yeah, it's really incredible. We have so much talent here. Um, it's great. Any, any given Any weekend, auditions are packed, aren't yeah. they? Auditions yeah. are packed. Any weekend, you can have your choice of five or six plays to go see and three Unfortunately, more Unfortunately, five or six. I mean, it's like, <laughs> no, wait. I mean, I can't see them all. Yeah. It's a good problem to have. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. A, it's a good problem to have, yes. Um, so you've got a pretty good cast there, and what t I always love to know about the set. Tell me about the set. Oh, the set That's is nice. It's That's nice. Good. Um, David Zbarankin is my set designer. It's my first time working with him, uh, and he has exceeded any expectation that I had. Really? It's a full, it, it, the whole play takes place in Alan's apartment. One set? One set. One set. That's, that's always good. There, yeah. So the way the play <laughs> Money-wise, it's good. Yeah. The, way, <laughs> the way the play is formatted, there's kind of scenes that take place almost like they're in Alan's imagination. Okay. But the, the set is, remains the same. It is Alan's New York City apartment. Um, it's great. There's swinging doors yeah. and, and uh, uh, it's, there's levels to it. It's really yeah. fabulous. Yeah. It's very 70s Art Deco style. It's very Art fun. Deco. So he got yeah. so he got all the the, the uh, props and stuff that he needed. Then oh that. yeah, he he took off. A, he was telling us he took off a week from his day job yeah. and said, "I'm just going to hammer this out." So by second week of rehearsal, we actually had you had your set. our yeah. levels and our doors, and it was very nice. Yeah. Yep. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that's set design, first of all, is the talent. Mm -hmm. Building it is the next yeah. thing. Yeah. So, I mean, because yeah. it takes a lot to build. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mentioned this uh, uh, from some of my other guests with, that, with theaters, that there's so much more to go with theater. I mean, you see the actors up on the stage and they do a fabulous job. We love you. <laughs> there are also people behind there, like the director, the producer, you're looking at the sound people, you're looking at the er, person, you know, or the set design, the lighting. There's so much that goes yeah. into a production. And remember, if I can just reiterate, these are all volunteers doing this for you. So get out there and pay for those tickets. <laughs> 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 right, and not only that, I don't know if you all know it, but, and, and Evan, you can address this. Do you have to pay to play this, to do this? Oh yeah, we have to, we have to pay. T uh, tell the audience. Typically, <laughs> uh, depending on what publisher uh, the play is published by, it's, it's uh, I mean, musicals are even more expensive, but yeah. I think this play is 125 per performance. Per um, performance? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes we pay a rights of like two thousand dollars for right. for a play, Plus or twelve hundred dollars, or fifteen hundred, or three thousand, yeah. depending it's on not the play. Cheap. No. Yeah, so that's just the basic. So when you buy that ticket, there's a lot going into it. Even though they're all volunteers, there's a lot that goes into yeah. equipment and, and the set design and building it and buying everything. Yeah, absolutely. Alexandra, how, have you been acting long? I know, I know all about Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just sit here. <laughs> I, I love you, Ryan. <laughs> um, I have been acting a pretty long time. I started in middle school um, and have been doing it ever since. Actually, Ryan and I met yes. 10 years ago this summer doing yeah. a musical together. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, I have been acting quite, quite a while. I haven't done as much in the community theater space in the area, so I really just kind of started that with the minutes. And as you mentioned, it's a wonderful community. There are Isn't so it many great? opportunities. Isn't it great? So many opportunities for onstage, backstage. As you said, you go to the auditions and they're packed, so people are excited about it. So we didn't even talk about costumes. Yes. You have, to, you have to have someone to do the costumes. <laughs> do the costumes. And they will be, we haven't seen them yet, but I'm sure they will be very fun in yeah. this play. Who's doing the, the costumes? Beth Ruman is doing is our Beth costumes. Doing? And she's okay, the Beth's best in the it. business. Okay. Oh, yeah. Very excited. So uh, please uh, get your tickets, and you can get your tickets at, uh, at their, on their website or else you can also get them on, um, at, at the door, uh, at the door as well. So we want to make sure that you get out there and see some of these great productions. May yeah. 10th through the 19th. Yes. Yeah. Pardon? May 10th through May 19th. May 10th through the 19th at the Civic Player. Correct. Yeah, lots of street parking and wherever. Sure. You'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> Just get there. Just get there and enjoy it. Show so, up early anyway. anyway. Yeah. Um, so thank you all for being here. And we're gonna be thank talking you. about reading is fun. Is reading fun? It is preciously fun. I know it is. And I love it when, you know, I, I have books all over my house. Now, I've started this one, I've started that one, I've started that one, I've started. And it's all whatever the mood I'm in is what I read. I find as I get older, I become more daring as a reader. I used to go uh, seriatim one book at a time. Now I'm reading four books at I a do time. Do that. Yeah, I do that too. I have a mystery going, and then I have a, a, a historical book going, and I've got, yeah. And it's fun because it just whatever mood you're in, you it read, is, right? It is, it is. So what does reading is fun do for kids? All right, first let me say- Oh, uh, and you say you got Bookworm with you. Well, this is Bookworm, uh, our mascot, and whither I go, so goes Bookworm. Uh, he, she, it is all over the place. Bookworm, I bookworm. I love it, I love it. Bookworm, okay. Uh, we're I don't even know where you found that, but I like it. We found it. I'm not going to tell you because <laughs> no, we, you're not going to tell me because we're going to come back there and look for something. Want one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're in our 11th year. Uh, we're deeply committed to uh, promoting and achieving early childhood literacy in Schenectady, uh, which has a major problem among many other locations oh, in the country. Yeah. With this it's, issue. it's not just here either. Okay. Uh, we have a two-prong strategy. The first prong involves mobilizing a large cohort every year of volunteers to work in the schools, not in classrooms, with children having... You're talking uh, after school usually? No, no, during school. Oh, during we, school we as well. Pull, okay, pull them out, okay. Uh, working up to an hour, one-on-one uh, -on -one with needy school children. Uh, this year, I'm proud and delighted to say we have 110 volunteers. Oh, that's wonderful, Al. Working with, believe it or not, 275 children. Oh, wow, that's a lot. Okay. Ages four to nine. 
pre-K through K, through grades one, two, and three in all 11 elementary schools. Now, our second prong, well, wait, wait, let, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. What is the commitment? Like if, up I, to if an, someone up to, uh, wanted to volunteer. Up to an hour once a week. Once a, well, an hour once a week, up okay, to, Up to an hour once a week. I say up to because some kids can't handle an hour. Others can handle an hour, an hour. three quarters okay. of an hour, et cetera. The second prong involves fundraising, okay, because we are deeply committed to the notion, to the principle and an operation of gifting books to children. Okay. Many of the children in Schenectady who are in need of the program come from environment, social, family, what have you, where reading has uh, less of a presence of a salience. Okay. There are few of any books, printed matter in the house. Okay. So each session that our volunteer works with a kid once a week gifts the kid on behalf of Riff a book to take home and keep in the family venue and with which to build a home library. Yeah, not only that, but maybe their siblings will read it Absolutely. Now. So over 30 or 40 weeks, a kid can get 40, uh, as many as 30 or 40 volumes. And where do you get all these books? Uh, we uh, get the donations. The library, I'm sure, has. No, we, have, but we buy from Scholastic principally. Oh, okay. okay, we do very well with that. Uh, several local foundations, large and small, make uh, their commitments annually, which help. Okay, we get donations from other organizations and private individuals, okay. Uh, but here's where Scrabble-Rama comes in. We have two major events during the year. One is not a fundraiser, but it draws heavy funding. The so-called Spring Into Reading is Fun program. This year it's, it's a five-day event, Monday to Friday, the 22nd to, to the 26th of April, so it's and impending. And where, where is this held? In, in the, um, in all of the first grade classes okay. throughout the school districts. So we'll be serving, we will have a volunteer in each class reading to children and then donating to them, okay, a little bag this bag. wonderful imprinted bag with a wonderful t-shirt and five books that's to cool. take home. Oh, that's wonderful. Right? And in a single grant, we are producing 4,000 volumes for that event. Wow. In addition, many more thousands, okay, come via donations from the Seymour Fox Foundation in, Schenect in uh, Troy. The major sponsor of the Spring Into Reading is Fun program event is the well-renowned, re justifiably, Wright Family Foundation in Schenectady. Okay, uh, so we need money to gift books. And this year we're programming gifting 12,500 books. Oh, we will give away wow. 12,000. And, and, and believe me, on the evidence of our first 10 years, when I say we will give it away, it is chiseled in stone. We will give them away. We will not fail to do so. And we will increase the number of students we work with every year, volunteers, books we donate, and the need for money every year to pay do for you, that. Do you find that it's almost like this should be spreading across the country. Uh, it's not. The figures are daunting. They're staggering. No, we, but what you're doing, it, oh, you know, it's like this should be in every community. We should have people that are doing this. We should, but we have to understand. Uh, when I first got on the reading track, I was three and a half years old, and my mother sat me down at the kitchen table, and we started, and we went every Saturday morning to a library. I, okay. I, that's how I was brought up. Okay. I was able to read when going in, the, in kindergarten. There has been a profound change. The, the society, as a very good friend of mine, college mate, said to me a few years ago, when I said, gee, New York City, I really miss it, he said, Al, the city you grow up in no longer exists. The place names exist, Rockefeller Plaza and uh, Fifth Avenue and what have you. And this is not a put down at all. We are, our demography is changing. Things have changed. You know, culturally we've, we've changed. We've into social media uh, and uh, kids uh, don't pick up a book. Uh, they uh, wanted to check their Facebook. Absolutely. So look, it would be bad enough if the problems on with regard to early childhood literacy were peculiar to, unique to Schenectady, they're not. They're not. In microcosm, they're reflected all over the country. The most recent figure I saw, official figures. We're that one of the most illiterate countries. We are, we are. At least 25 million children are reading below the appropriate level. I, as a professional political scientist, tend to multiply figures like that by four or five. Yeah. I mean, we are in deep, deep, deep six. Well, I was just reading somewhere, they said that newspapers try and write their articles on a fifth grade reading level. Oh. And I'm saying, what? Yeah. 
look, I had a call from a teacher in Schenectady High School about five years ago saying, will you please help me? We can't, we don't work with high schoolers, but she thought I might be able to help. She said, I'm teaching four classes, 17 year olds, 11th grade, who are reading at the second grade level. <gasps> Wait a minute. I thought, well, you know, I'm 86. At that time, I was about 81. Perhaps I have a hearing problem. I said, oh, you mean seventh grade level, which would have been, no, no, one, two, three. I mean the second grade level. Whereupon I asked my wife, who taught English for, eight, for 25 years in the school district, could this be? She said, I had many, many students in the eighth grade who were reading at the second grade level. But second grade, think second about grade. that. That's like nothing. Second grade. So how can you even comprehend when you don't understand the words? I'm not going to even try to answer that question. I would have to consume an old all day well, program what, like what this. What has happened to our educational system? I know it's not the teachers because they break their backs trying to make things work. They work very hard. And for many of them, if not most of them, if not all of them in an exemplary way, their challenges are monumental. School, did, look. I never went to a public school from kindergarten right through a PhD, which provided housing, clothing, uh, legal aid, and what mm -hmm. has we're yeah. doing in Schenectady and what have you. It's a different time. It's a different space. Yeah. It's, a, it's the same geographic space that's constant. But what fills that space continues to morph and morph and morph in ways that are well, that I mean, it's sad incredible when we, challenges. When we think that we're one of the leading countries of the world, we're not, and we and we are really. I mean, healthcare, everything is. We're down at the bottom on everything almost. Yeah, we're, and we're, we're not. Yet we still think we're so. You know, we got it all put together, but we don't. I no, shouldn't. I'm we, sorry. I didn't mean to politicize. No, we don't. But we don't. It's just the way it is. Because when I read the statistics. It's like, really, we're that low on health care? What, we're really that low on food security? What, we're really that low on? And I can't believe that. So, but I do because believe somebody it. did the numbers, right? Yeah, believe so it. So let's talk about Scrabarama. We have a, a few minutes to do that. And uh, where is that going to be? It is going to be Ju June 1. The June 1st. Uh, the wonderful cafeteria in the Schenectady High School. Okay, can uh, anybody go? Or do you have any, to be a really good Scrabble no, player? No, you have to be a, at least 18 years old. Okay, you have to be 18. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's from 8.30 in the morning uh, till 11.30 in the morning. Uh, on Saturday, June 1st. And what happens? You just go and play we, with someone else? No, we have teams. We have, oh, teams, we have teams of teams. two to four people. Okay. Okay. And you register you have to as, come a as a team. team? Yeah, you, you, you play as a team. Okay. What if you just come alone? If you come alone, we could accommodate you, but I think it's better not only that it draws more revenue for us, but it's, it's better. Yeah, okay. That good. I just that, try to get yeah. a picture of this. And it's, it's competitive. Okay. okay? It's. Uh, it's dirt cheap. It's 20 bucks a head. Okay. And that includes a continental breakfast. And oh, my nice. wife supervises the continental breakfast, okay. so I know it's, it's a good gonna breakfast. It's going to be good. Okay. There's a raffle, okay? And uh, it's a lot of fun. Okay. It's a lot of fun prizes. Are there prizes for the, yeah. being the top on yeah, the yeah, 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 Scrabble, yeah, yeah, knowing yeah. those words that are so obscure you, you, that nobody you, <laughs> you, 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 you get your recognition. And I'm about to go over to the Whitney Bookstore to get two updated dictionaries. Oh, Scrabble dictionary. <laughs> because you have to pay for tiles and yeah. uh, oh, yeah. uh, we're, we're shameless. We, we need the money and every every buck we make out of Scrabble Rama goes right goes into right, Our costs are 99% buying books to give. And if you can't go to the Scrabble Rama, you can make a donation. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. Uh, get onto our website <coughs> and, and donate by all means. I mean, yeah. we're there for, and of course a volunteer. As I say, we had 110 this year. You know, the first time you had me on 11 years ago, oh you asked gosh. me, your first, your first question is, what does this have to do with political science? I said, not a damn thing. The second question was, uh, and how many volunteers would you like? I said, well, I could certainly lose 2,000. And you <laughs> said, 2,000? I said, I, I thought, not enough? Oh, I could use 4,000. <laughs> okay. okay. I'll have to replay that. <laughs> at, at, so, at, that's true. That's not apocryphal. Those I'm are the sure first two is, questions. Yeah. You do such wonderful work, and it was, it was his idea, and he kind of soldiered through this and made it happen and is still working very hard at it. I hope that you get a lot of volunteers. I hope that you make some money and those books get distributed. 
we need to get kids reading. We really do, and and I think you're part of that solution. But. And, and so are you. I mean, you know, I I said to you uh, just a while ago before the program, I'm determined to live forever, if not longer, and I'm determined to do so partly because you're going to program this show forever, and I'll be I, around I'll be, to yeah, we'll be, and I'll we'll, be around we'll to be watch the last it. Last man standing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you so much, Alan. Good luck. And, delighted. And delighted. I hope, and uh, get that dictionaries out. Delighted. So we're going to go. Okay, we're going to be talking about the Joan Nepal Prince House. And you're brand new, aren't you, Tony? I am. I've been with the home for about five years now. Okay. Um, so thank you for having yeah, me Yeah, it's been a while uh, since has, you've been on, uh, yeah, the, the organization has been here. So yeah. thank you for uh, letting me represent the home. Right. Uh, for people who don't know what the Joan Nepal Prince home is, we're going to let Tony explain the mission and the philosophy. So Take it away, Terry. <laughs> Tony. So the mission of the Joe Nicole Prince Home is to provide a safe and comfortable environment for those in need of a home during their final days. So we take residents in from the capital region who have a prognosis of three months or less, and we provide shelter for them. But on top of that, we provide them with meals, um, we give them their medication, and most importantly, so you, I'm sorry, you give them, the, they have their medication available? Or, correct. Uh, yeah, okay. Yep. So we're giving them their meals, their medication, and most of all, companionship and love. We treat our residents as if they were a member of our own family. And that's absolutely what, how they want, we want them to feel when they enter our home. We allow them to bring in their own items, their own personal items, whether it be their favorite pillow or blanket. Oh, nice. So it's a home-like. They're it's making it their home. Absolutely. It's definitely a home-like setting. We have a beautiful interior in the home. Uh, the outside of the home. I have to stop over there. Please yeah, do. I will. The yeah. outside is just as beautiful as the inside. We allow our residents to go outside if they want to. We have some wildlife. We'll put up bird feeders for them. Um, we do welcome them to bring in their own hobbies. Um, there's often times when, just recently, I was doing a Where's Waldo book with one oh of my Oh my. Residents. She was 86 years old and we had a blast. She's laying in bed and we're looking for Waldo. Um, we'll read Did with you find them. him? We found, we found <laughs> him. We'll, you know, we'll read with them, we'll cook with them, do any activities that allow for them to handle. Um, and. We care for them at end of well, life. Well, is there like, do you have a nurse on duty? Or? We do not. We just, okay. we have caregivers on duty. Okay. Uh, and the real heart of our home is our resident care volunteers. And those volunteers are, they range in age from 18 all the way up. I have one that's about 85 years old. Okay. Providing hands-on care for our residents. And that includes turning and positioning them, changing them if needed, but again, more companionship. Right. And being... And family, cooking, probably cooking, cooking. And cooking, yeah, and being a companion to them. Okay, yeah, that's it. Well, it's uh, is is this like a model, or has there are there others so like this? There are others like this. This model started out in the Rochester area of New York, um, to try to keep people right within their communities. So we have served over and two rather than a hospital exactly, and being isolated. Yeah, exactly. So we have served over two hundred fifty-eight residents in the capital region since opening our doors. Are really that many? Yes, since 2006. Wow. Very proud to say that number, yes. Yeah, that's wonderful that, that they, they feel comfortable. How many? A absolutely. How many clients? I, I don't know, so clients? We, so I, a, I don't know what to call. It's okay, we call yeah. them residents. Residents. Um, it's a two bed facility. Oh, just so two beds. So we're really getting that hands on. They're getting you know all the attention that they, they are. need. Um, they're getting Do they get love. to interact? Absolutely. If they want to, the families have interacted. Um, sometimes you'll find them sitting in the family rooms together, getting to know each other. Um, sometimes, you know, we're just sitting with them, holding their hand right at the bedside. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so do you have like a waiting? I mean, we what, always, what happens? I can't even imagine <laughs> doing two people and knowing that there's other people that Want to be Absolutely. There. So we say we take those with the greatest need and the least resources. The least resources. Absolutely. So we because do. some people have lost, when they get to that age, they may have lost their children, they lost their spouse, they Absolutely. lost. Their, well, parents are gone. Oh. Yep. So they don't have anyone to care for them, and that's where we step in. We do have a continuous wait list, and when a bed becomes available, we go out and screen them, and again take those who we feel it needs the bed most. Is there a cost? 
That's the best part. It's free of charge. Wow. So our residents do not have to pay a dime to live there. But in return, that's where we depend on local community support. And a fundraiser. And fundraisers. Which is what grants. we're going to talk about next. Yep, local grants and national grants. So we Oh, you do get grants as yes. well because you're nonprofit. That's correct. Yeah. So we really need the community funding. And that could be a $20 bill. That could be a roll of toilet paper. All of that is so appreciated to run our home. So we are. So what do you have? What needs do you have, say, this, I know money is always great, but is there anything that you need? Do you need somebody to bring a plant? Do, I mean, what do you need? Yes, money is always welcome. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. However, yes. Because you got to pay for food. We do have to pay for food. Plants are always welcome. I just like made that said, up, yes, but, but plants, it worked yes, out, right? Toilet paper, paper towels, any household needs like cleaning supplies, Clorox wipes, rubber gloves, things like that, all those types of things. We also accept... Um, what we call DME, dura durable medical equipment. So let's say, you know, someone had lost a family member. We'll take their used walker, but then oh, in return, that's good to know. we can donate it back to the community. Let's say someone had a hip replacement. Yeah. I need a walker. Do you have an extra? Absolutely. So it's given to That's really good to know because when that does happen, you don't know what to do with a lot of this. Absolutely. And we so, get, and you yeah. think, well, do I bring it to the Goodwill or do I bring it right. where? But this to me is makes more sense. Absolutely. Yep. So we have walkers, we have shower chairs, um, the rollator walkers. So we really, you know, can share with the community members that need it. Well, I know that someone uh, that I had talked to, they had, uh, I guess, a couple of things and they couldn't give them away they brought them to the dump and i thought oh, oh yeah, that's, that's such a shame yeah, yeah. yep so and we'll those take, things are um, expensive they sure are and we'll take uh insure we'll take diapers the only thing we won't take is medicine well you yeah you can't, can't do that yeah, yeah you can't yeah. do that um but no th that makes sense so what um so do do physicians come in and visit their patients there? Well, well, how so, do they get their care is what sure. I Sure. So I mean medical care. Our medical provider is hospice. Oh, okay. So, so hospice is wonderful. Absolutely. So they each are, of our uh, They're absolutely phenomenal. They're all on re um, hospice service. Okay. So, hospice, so they take care of everything. They do. They will come in, assess them weekly, assess them as needed. We are their surrogate family, so we'll communicate with the residents and the families and hospice and say hey you know what maybe their medication needs to be increased or things are changing maybe we should change this type of care for them and so we're the advocate for that resident because you're and with them all the time absolutely. so you can kind of see absolutely what's going so on hospice will tony what's your background change. yeah patient care really it's all patient care i have always loved taking care of people. there you go yeah and so my heart is in this home and yeah. i i love what i do yeah, I know um, Ed, uh, you know, who I'm talking about. Oh, he, yeah, know, he's Ed, a good friend of Ed, mine, and he loves you. Oh, well, and he, he said to say hello today. Yeah, yeah. And he was actually just there yesterday um, doing some yard work. I'm already getting him outside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Got to keep him busy. He talks about it, and I said, yeah. oh, I haven't had them on the show. And that's when I, I, I reached out oh, to you. Oh, well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, because of that, yeah. because he just said, he just thinks that what you do is phenomenal. It is wonderful. So we're always seeking resident care volunteers, but we're also looking for volunteers who wanna help out in other ways, like do yard work, maybe cook a meal, maybe cook a treat, some extra cookies to have for you know the staff or the volunteers. Oh, oh staff? Hmm. <laughs> okay. But we're always looking for volunteers to help out in different ways, maybe even be a set extra set of hands. Maybe, um, you know, just sit with them, read them a book, things like that. Well, you know, if you have like a Girl Scout troop that mm -hmm. is looking for a, a project. Absolutely. We this welcome. might be mm -hmm. something nice. They could make cards for them Absolutely. or for, for the residents yes. or they could make uh, cookies or yes. decorations. Yep. or. We actually have a rock garden that needs some TLC in the there backyard. There you go. So. Yeah. Yeah. They could get their badge for mm -hmm. gardening, Absolutely. gardening badge. Yeah. We <laughs> welcome groups to come in to do yard work. We have college groups that come in or, you know, even businesses like Key Bank or MVP has come in, CDPHP has come in to help us out. A lot of our corporations are encouraging their employees to take on a project of Absolutely. this, to reach out yeah. to the community. And we really embrace We it. have lost yeah. a lot of community involvement and mm -hmm. I think in a way you know we get so 
caught up in our own lives that we, sure we forget that there are people Abs that need need us. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So years ago during COVID, Habitat for Humanity actually came out. They painted the interior of our home. Did they? Oh, they're great. And yeah. I fell in love with painting. So in return, oh, there's Madeline I, there I, waving I, because she was oh, okay. executive director of it. Yeah. <laughs> so in return, I painted a couple of their homes because I fell in love with painting. I fell in love with Habitat's mission. Yeah. And so you got to give back. Yeah, when you can. Yeah, and there's so much uh, in our community. We've talked about the thrift stores that are out there and that are raising money for their mission. And uh, Habitat for Humanity, of course, has a restore where you can yes. purchase mm -hmm. um, uh, gently used, uh, mm -hmm. which I bought a rocker there that's so, fabulous. Okay. And I couldn't new. believe I looked all over for one. I happened to walk in there. There it was, and it had my name right on it. You know? yeah. so, so we have a lot of in our community that tries to give back. And Habitat is one, you mentioned them. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you're doing is like a real hands-on. We really are, yes. So how many volunteers do you do you have, or how many more would you like? So like like Al said, um, I would like 4,000 as well. Okay, well, <laughs> let's see. Uh. I do have about 50. Oh, I well, that's good. I do have about 50, yes. Yeah. Um, and again, these, these people are all walks of life. I have college students who are going into the health profession, which is wonderful because- They're learning. They're learning. Yeah. They're learning end of Hands life on. care. They're learning how to hold a hand to someone who's dying. It's not, not just passing out medication. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And then I have people who are retired nurse practitioners. I have stay at home moms. So people with all different experiences, we welcome to the home. Okay, so Tony, you heard her here from Tony here. She's the executive director of the Joan Nicole Prince House. You can go to their website, which we put up there. And we did have a picture of the, their, their home, yes. which is just a beautiful place, and it's located in Scotia, is we that correct? We are located in Scotia, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much Thanks for being for here, me. and thank you. keep up the good work, thank and you. you know, lots of love there. Thank you, thanks, Dan. Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna switch right over here to our next guest, who is doing something phenomenal. Can I say that? Thank you. When I read, Anne-Marie uh, Schwartz, when I read what you were performing and who you got to come here and the background of what I was, it, it, I don't know what to say. <laughs> well, these are the Dutch, many of the Dutch, Dutch right. so tell Jewish us a little composers. bit, because I'm already saying this, but she's going to explain it. Okay, so coming up in the beginning of May, there's a sort of convergence of two very important anniversaries. One is Dutch Remembrance Weekend, which is always the first weekend in May, where the Dutch commemorate those who died in World War II and beyond in military conflicts. Mm -hmm. And then on the start of the evening of May 5th is International Holocaust Day, which is Yom HaShoah. I just get chills when I... <laughs> I know. And uh, so with the encouragement of Dutch Culture USA, who alerted me to this simply unbelievable musical archive called the Leo Smets Archive, which is based in the Netherlands. We're pulling music from this archive. Um, it's entirely Dutch Jewish composers. Some of them survived the war. Some of them did not did survive not the survive. war. Yes. Yeah, they, they, was, uh, they weren't uh, you know, selective. They just right. they were big broad brush. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and. Um, all of them were deeply affected because the Nazi machine was so focused on eradicating the, every aspect of these composers, whether books they killed or, them or not. Well, I or mean, not. music I mean, books, everything. Music books, and so they went from having these wonderful lives as performers, as composers, as musical institutions within their community to being eliminated. They couldn't perform anymore. Or they could only perform in a Jewish kind of situation that was very limited, sort of underground. And so even if they lived past the war, their careers were destroyed. They were out of the musical canon. Oh, I hadn't canon. thought about that. It was very yeah. effective. I mean, in the most awful <laughs> kind of, you know, devastating you know, I, I way. I mean, what humans do, to, I mean, I, it just, and I know that I look at, at many of the Holocaust, you know, the stories and things, and we talk more and more about that. And we don't want to eradicate that. We want people to know what happened, because it could happen again. Right. And it's amazing how easy it is to go into that mode <laughs> sometimes. Um, 
this music from this archive, it includes both men and women. Uh, so on this program, we have music of Hans Krieg. We have music of Paul Herman, who did not survive. We have music of Ignaz Lillian, a, a fabulous composer. Also music of Rosie Wertheim, a, a beautiful piece called Sagan, which means gypsy. How did the music itself survive? Because it seems to me they wanted to, they were burning books, they were doing all that, so. Well, I think some of it had already been published, oh, okay. so it was beyond it was where worldwide. they could be. It was worldwide. Others just disappeared into attics and garden sheds and yeah. <laughs> basements and is still now turning up. There may oh, be family okay. members who yeah. survived who had access to it. Yeah. One of the pieces we're performing is a piano trio by Hans Lachmann. And piano trio? Oh, piano trio, so violin, cello, piano. Okay. And um, the, it was only in manuscripts, so we actually have engraved the music and are donating it to the archive after we're done oh, with wonderful. it. Oh, wonderful. Most of this music we're giving the North American premieres of. It's very high quality music, and there is a great variety of styles. This piano trio is called, is in 12 tone style, which makes it a little bit less accessible <laughs> in terms mm -hmm. of the, um, harmonies of it, but it's still very compelling and dark and it fits in with the whole sort of aspect of the program, I think. Affect is probably a better word. Mm -hmm. um, the music is, the singer, by the way, that we're bringing is coming. She studied in oh, she's the been Netherlands. Every, Brussels, I mean, everywhere. I mean, yes. just amazing woman. And she's, she's young. And she's we had a in picture a, of her up there, I think. Elisaveta Agrofanina. Yeah. Um, she is based in Brussels, but she studied in Holland. And yeah, there, there's a, a small picture of her yeah. up there, but we do have a larger one, I think, somewhere. She is yeah. extremely passionate about this repertory and has really made a career of working with this repertory, performing it. So when she comes... And there she, she is. I mean, such a young woman. She is too. a young woman. And just incredibly, if you speak to her, just very passionate about performing this music and getting the word out about this music. So we're actually doing two different programs. Uh, on May 4th and May 6th, we'll be doing a program that just is soprano, violin, and piano. With a violin... But is it the same music from... It's not entirely the same. So okay. if you want to go on the 4th and the 5th, you're going to hear two different programs, which okay. I think is kind of so nice. So the 5th is the one that you're going to focus on the Dutch. They're, they're all. Oh, they all are. That's what She's, I was wondering. She has so much repertory. She's okay. like, i got to do two gotcha, programs. Gotcha. I'm coming here. Yeah, they're all different. They're, all, they're different. But I think that you'll get a wonderful sense no matter which, pro, you know, which program you select. Which performance But wait, where is this going to be? So May 4th is at the Arkell Museum in Canada Harry. And that program, um, they have this amazing recreation of the Night Watchman picture. So there's this whole tie-in oh, with the Dutch. Oh, nice. But um, so there, there's no cello, but we're doing the Modern Time Violin Sonata by Lilienz. We're doing a piece by Paul Herman. He's one of the ones who was killed in the concentration camp. Um, a Toccata, which is just unbelievable. And, and it's so virtuosic for the solo piano. Um, and then May 5th, we'll be at Congregation Beth Emmeth in Albany, and this is the one with the manuscript that we engraved by Hans Lachman. Oh. Um, and Charlotte Wilson from WMHT, who actually worked with Takata Records, which has been recording some of this music from the archive, will be moderating a pre-concert talk beforehand. And then on the 6th, we'll be up at the Strand Theater in Hudson Falls with the same program from the 4th. So I strongly encourage people to, to hear at least one of one the programs, of yeah. if not more. Yeah. And, and not only that, what I really like is that you're reaching out to different areas either. It's not all in Albany, or it's not, you know. Right. I mean, right. granted, there's one in Albany, but the fact that you're going to Hudson, I mean, just in Canada, here, yeah. Well, in the Hudson Falls area with Strand Theater, which is our, our beautiful venue, mm -hmm. has made such a commitment to the performing arts and trying to bring great material up to up to that region which is a little bit underserved so it's underserved you're yeah. absolutely right because you know it's just the the, the population that you're dealing you know right and and yeah. Jonathan Newell who runs the theater and has single-handedly kind of revived it is so committed to really bringing things from all over and there. it enriches the community it enriches the community the ticket prices are very affordable yeah um, so I encourage people hopefully there'll be one of these concerts over the three days that people can 
can yeah, attend. I'm sure. So you've got this going on, and what else you got planned, or anything special? Oh my gosh, we well we're getting we're on the cusp cusp of our 25th anniversary, which oh, is next year. Oh, congratulations! Yeah. Thank you. I can't believe that we. I can't either. But yeah. you've been probably coming on 25 years. <laughs> Probably almost. We are doing an opera in June at the Troy Music Hall. An called, opera? Yes, okay, called nice. Waterbird, A Waterbird Talk by Dominic Argento, who was an American composer. Joseph Hahn, who is our new baritone at the community college, is a ph phenomenal operatic baritone, and he'll be the lead in this opera. And Brian Sheldon, you may know Brian Sheldon. I know Brian very well. He is directing it. So we're thrilled about this. It's going to be a very exciting performance. And where is this going to be? Troy Musical. Troy Musical. Oh, G great June 15th. venue. Yes, yes. So it's an opera. It's a, did you say it's American opera? It's American opera. Yeah, that's yes. what I thought you said. Yes, yeah. based on a monologue by Chekhov. So oh, the, I love Chekhov. Yeah. Oh, anything Chekhov wrote. I think I've read everything of Chekhov. Well, the, it's got an interesting title in the original Chekhov, which is On the Harmful Effects of Tobacco. Oh, really? And okay. then Argento changes it to something about water birds and uh, Audubon. Okay. And so it's really interesting. The first half will actually be the Chekhov monologue, and the second half will be the Argento. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yes. Yeah, yes. that's wonderful. So you've got a lot going on. We do, yeah, we yeah. do. And you're a violinist. I am practicing hard right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to say that I have seen some of your videos. Okay. You know, and I, I mean, if you've never seen them, go to YouTube and see where if you can find them. Where you have um, uh, Vlad and his wife, you know. Yes, Florin Vlad, yeah. yes. Yeah. And Florin Natalia. And, yeah, yeah, his wife. Uh, dance and then the violin and you do that in the the, the where is Kenmore it? Kenmore Hotel. Yeah, the hotel. Yes, Kenmore, yeah, ballroom, uh, yeah, over in Albany. Yeah, amazing video. Thank I've you. watched it probably three or four times because really every nice time one. I watch it, it's like oh, this is amazing. Well, this is amazing. Our last one, who features Gabriella Pizzolo, who oh went, yes, yes, I know Gabriella. So we've gone into six film festivals with that and wow. been a contender for the best short film. So we're very excited. And next who year, who does the film on that? Because that it's is Chromoscope. Uh, okay. Zach Rucker and um, Nick Spadaro, and they do wonderful work. They're based in they, Detroit. The, the filming is amazing. They are very high quality. It's very, very high yes. quality. It's yeah. like, this is amazing. And they're great partners, and they're wonderful to work with. Well, I have to congratulate you on that Thank wonderful uh, filming. That I, and I had to mention it because when I see it, it's like amazing, and it's just so well done. I don't know the the blending and the and the way the music and the dance. I mean everything about it. Everyone you do, and I, I don't mean just the one, but they're amazing. Yeah, keep I it agree. up. Yeah, Thank you. And get into those film festivals. Those are wonderful. We can't believe it. I know. Isn't it nice? <laughs> yes, it is nice. So they must submit it, right? No, we. I submitted you them. You submitted. Yeah, somebody said you should submit this to us. And you go, oh festival. no, nobody wants to. Oh, see I said it. nobody will ever. I mean, and then we're on our sixth, and we have a couple more. It looks like that we're going to be gonna do selected for. More? Yeah. Do you do them all at the Kenmore? No, 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 I didn't think so. We did the the last one with Gabriella, which is a modern retelling of the legend of Sleepy Hollow, yeah. on site in at historic it's, sites okay, in yeah. Columbia County. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was a, they were well, great to work with too. You're doing some really innovative. Thing. Thank you. I have a lot of fun. You do have a lot of fun. I, nobody should have as much fun as Anne Marie does. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you're doing is wonderful. And as I said, I was just, uh, the word is breathtaking when I read what you were doing. And I thought, what a blessing to allow this music to be heard more, to spread it out, and to not forget the people that wrote beautiful music and were un obliterated from right. the earth. Right, exactly. And this music is really high quality music. We're not performing it just because of what the archive is. No, no, I know. Well, you wouldn't do that. Music. That's not what you do. Right. So. <laughs> thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Thank you for And thank me. you for what you do and for bringing beautiful music to our community and beyond. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate Thanks. that. And now I'm talking to a, an author. You've been on the show before. Yes, on yes, Sh Sheena. Tell me, because I love what you're talking about, unmasking. So tell us what you do and why you're an advocate. Well, unmasking is basically about unmasking who you are and being your true self. 
And the re one reason I went down this road is because when I went through domestic violence. So wearing that mask was a hard one. Okay. You know, and carrying five different health conditions, I don't look like what I go through. So my goal is to teach people how to love who they are regardless of the cards they dealt or what they've been through. Okay, and how, how do you do that? Well, I mean, I, because <laughs> sometimes you just feel as though you're such a failure or something, you know, whatever. Absolutely. Well, between spiritual, mental, and emotional, you know, I use affirmations. I write, which is very therapeutic, and I also... What was the name of your book, Unmasking? Um, well, I have several. Okay, okay. So, if we start with the unmasking, we have The Mask Behind the Mask, okay. which was the first book that I wrote. And then we have Unveil the Broken Pieces of a Mask. And I like the theme that you're using the word mask it's in each all one. Yeah. And then if we want to go with the trilogy, which was the last one I did, was The Evolution of the Mask. Okay. And with that, it's poetry that help inspire people to be the best version of themselves. Okay. You know, it helps people to give empowerment, inspiration, and inspire them to just know that regardless of what you've been through, we can go through this and not self-sabotage ourselves and just Oh, I love self-sabotage. Yeah. Isn't that a good phrase? Absolutely. Because we do tend to self, we, you know, yeah. we, we get this far and then we, oh, we can't do that. And we, mm -hmm. you know, we- And we pull back. We pr so my goal is to help people to show up. Okay. Show up unapologetically, authentically themselves. Okay. And within that, I also go to the YWCA. I was just going to ask, Center, you must be, you must be reaching out. I do. I go there and I do workshops with them, self-esteem and, you know, self-love workshops with them to teach them that, yeah, you took this trauma, you might have been through something, but you can get through it. And it's a way for me to bring the light to them and show them that I took this walk and I can show you how to be a better version of yourself. Yeah. Well, having been through some trauma, I don't want to say helps, that sounds horrible, but it, 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 it maybe makes you more understanding. Yes, it, it helps me show them that I took the walk unfortunately, but I've gotten to a better place. Yeah, not only that, but you're spreading the word. Yes. So it's, it's I mean, something horrible happens, yes. but you are able to convert that into um, a message. Yeah, I took my pain and made it a passion. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I went from thriving to I went from surviving to thriving. Okay, being able to inspire people to you have a story, it's okay to share it. So that's why I'm on like my seventh book now, being able to use my word for power. Okay, so let's talk about your your books. Okay, first of all, tell me what I would see in the first one. The first one is more of the impact of what I've been through. It, we, we talk about power, control, talk about showing up, you know, learning to let go. It, it's, you know, I, that was the journey of, I had a mask on. I went through emotional, physical abuse. I do carry five different health conditions, but I took the power back and allowed myself to use my words and help heal myself through my journey. Mm -hmm. The second book, is where I help people take their walk and learn to embrace themselves through poetry, but I also give them affirmations. I give them a space to ask themselves questions, and I also give them a journal, like with pieces in the back they can write and talk with themselves because, you know, we have yeah. to learn to embrace Diaries what are, are good in a way because it allows you to put something on paper. Yes. You know, and then see it, and mm -hmm. it's kind of like not just all up here. Right. Stuck. You, you get it out. Because some people, the hardest thing to do is to talk about it, so that gives them space to write about it. Do you give workshops or anything? I do. I do okay. workshops. So if someone wanted to have you do a workshop for I, their group or something, mm -hmm. you would do that? Yes, I've actually done workshops with kids, too. I actually did one with the Girl Scouts. I, um, I do, like I call it this uh, looking in the mirror workshop where I do masses and they get to paint what they feel. So they take the plain mask, they paint on it, but they write how they feel at the moment. So they get to take a look in the mirror of where they are now oh. and embrace what that looks like. Yeah, and, and it, it's important because a lot of times we don't encourage self, you know, it's sort of like, it's always like out there, we mm -hmm. gotta, you know, put on our mask, mm -hmm. right? No matter, right. you know, you no get matter. up, you get up dressed and you're putting on your mask and you go to work and then you gotta be that person, right? Yeah, and it's like you're carrying a lot. 
in my going through my journey, I've learned that you know we have to be able to take all of it off and be naked and vulnerable, yeah, and accountable. We so, have to start from square one right. in a way, yeah, which is difficult. It is. It's Do you tough. find that um, when you talk to women that have been through this, how receptive are they, or are they resistant? saying, no, I've, I've been through stuff you can't imagine and I can't go any further. And I mean, I, I'm just making no, that no, up. No, absolutely. Know. But to be honest, I can say it's, it's, it's my purpose because when I walk into the room, I make them feel comfortable. I have a normal conversation with them. And a lot of times I actually get them to tell me things about them that they might have never told anybody oh, before. Oh, okay. And like when I go to these shelters, I've had them tell me they don't talk to them. And when I show up, I'm getting people that don't ever speak about nothing they go through. My energy gives them that safe space. So they can feel they can talk to you yes. and, 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 and let it out, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. And then how do you how do you react when they tell you something horrible that's happened to them? You know, I remind them that, you know, we have to take accountability, but they also have to remember that it wasn't their fault. It wasn't their fault. And they have and to. Most, and most often, 90% of right. the, 99 percent of the time, it's not their, their fault. fault. And they have to learn to forgive, not for that person, but for themselves yeah. in order to heal. Forgiveness comes with strength. It comes with power, and they have to know that they have Can the you power. really forgive someone? You can. Yeah? Yeah. You think so? Yeah. I had to. Okay. More than once. Yeah. And I did it for myself, not for them. Okay. You know, I I like what you're saying. You did yes. it for yourself. I did it for myself. Because if you don't forgive us, that's that's that baggage you're carrying. You know, and it's like You can't carry it forever. Right. And me being a mom, I can't carry it because then I don't want to be too aggressive to my kids. I don't no. want to put all that anger and frustration on them. So to be a better mom and a better person, I had to learn to let it go. Yeah. I had to learn to forgive and how they say forgive and let go. Yeah. And well, it's it's you know what I always say is when you carry around a lot of that, you're giving a lot of space in your head to somebody you that, that you shouldn't be giving space to. Absolutely. Right? And my goal is not to give nobody space or the opportunity to say they have still time cuz time is something you I don't want you that. to have any control exactly. over me no matter what. Exactly. And that's kind of how I feel too that if someone injures you, I just, you know, go, mm -hmm. go, go. <laughs> I don't it goes back to one of my poems are called Control, to where, you know, not letting anybody control your time, your space, your minute and or hour of your day. You control who you are you and your control. character. I love and that. Oh, that's, that. you need to make a poster <laughs> of that one, I tell you. Let me, let me just tell you who's coming up. Don't, don't go anywhere. Uh, I just want to tell you who's coming up on the next show. We have the Alzheimer's Association. We have the Downtown Schenectady Improvement Corporation. The Landis Arboretum is coming up. And the, uh, the Amsterdam uh, Oratoria, they're doing a big uh, production there. And Spina Bifida will be with us as well. So we're coming back to you, Sheena. Um, so where, how can they reach you? You have a website, is that I correct? Do. I have a website, which is www.SheenaUnmaskingMotivation. But they can also find me on social media. You're on social media mm -hmm. too. I'm on Facebook as Sheena Godine. On Instagram as the Lady Behind the Mask 22. Okay, so if you want to, uh, perhaps if you're with an organization that could benefit from having uh, Sheena come and talk to you, or else maybe have you understand what people are going through so that you can better support them. Yes. Yeah, because a lot of times maybe you aren't haven't experienced that but it's important to know how to... How to safely guide someone. Through exactly, these and, and I don't mean to be therapeutic, but no, to, to not be, um, you know, criminalize them in a way, right. because a lot of times that's what happens. Yeah, they get blamed. They, yeah, get, they get blamed, blamed for the situation. Yeah. They get blamed for what's well, going on. Well, if you on. hadn't done yeah, that, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. yeah there, was, there was an instance where a woman was attacked and the judge said, well, what was she wearing? It's mm. like, that has nothing to right. do with it. <laughs> and, and you know, they, they start pointing fingers and that's where the judgment and the shame come in at. Yeah. So I'm the one that teaches them that regardless of people are gonna judge you, people are gonna say this and thing, you, you own that, yes, I went through that. Yeah. And no, it's not my fault and you're not gonna blame me for that. Yeah. I'm gonna stand up for who I am. I took my power back and I am me. I like taking your power back and I like the idea that you don't let someone else control 
your time, your mm -hmm. space, or anything like that. Absolutely. Because so easily women can fall into that mm -hmm. where they feel as though to be loved, they have to let someone control them. And we don't want that to happen, no, do we? No, not at all. And no. you have to understand that they're valuable. Yeah. And you know, through this journey, I, I teach people that they are worthy and deserving to be loved and they don't have to look for it nowhere else. It comes within them. From they gotta know that they have the power. Yeah. I like that. Give the women the power. Yes. Girl power, right? <laughs> Thank you for watching Capital Region today. I'm so happy you joined us. We had a great show. I hope you enjoyed all of our guests. If not, you can go to my YouTube channel and watch the whole show all over again, because we're right there for you. Thanks for watching.